Okay, hi folks, welcome back to my YouTube channel. In this video, I'm gonna be going over what I think is the best approach for studying jazz music. This video is aimed mostly at guitar players, but uh, some of these concepts and methods can be applied to any instrument. So uh, the world of jazz is extremely complex and attempting to take your first steps in can often be very intimidating and overwhelming, especially if you've been playing your instrument for a while and you're well versed in other styles. When you decide to get into jazz, it's really like learning a new language. And this is coming from a guy, me, who um, jazz was not my first style. Um, my family, as I was growing up, we listened to a lot of different styles of music, but um, jazz was not really one of them. And uh, it wasn't until I started playing in my high school jazz bands that um, my parents and I started to gravitate more towards jazz recordings. You know, we started to gain a little bit of interest and uh, I was looking for jazz guitar players that I liked, you know, just to get more familiar with the style. So um, it was also around this time that my longtime guitar teacher started working with me on some fundamental jazz concepts, which was a great starting point for me. And by the end of high school, I would say I was definitely interested in jazz and I wanted to pursue it more, but I didn't really have a sound approach. And I kept asking myself, you know, am I, am I doing this right? You know, is this, is this working for me? So after a few years of gaining experience at college, learning from valuable um, educators and getting insight from friends who uh, were more versed, well-versed in the jazz style, I formulated an approach that I still use to this day. So there's three main elements to my jazz approach. The first is learning tunes. Open up that real book and learn as many jazz standards as you can. The second is transcribing or learning from recordings, learning by ear, you know, and practicing it on your instrument and then writing down, you know, what you've learned. This is a great way to learn any type of language, you know, speaking, you know, foreign languages is how we a great way to practice that well. It works the same for music and especially jazz. And then the third thing is music theory, the thing that all guitar players love, scales, chords, modes, you know, all that fun stuff. Um, and these three elements make up what I like to call the jazz triangle. Just like we have a health triangle, you know, with physical, social, and mental health, uh, the jazz triangle, I think, makes up a healthy jazz practice. It may seem a little bit silly, but I think it, it does help. It makes sense to visualize it that way. And uh, I will say that learning tunes and transcribing are by far the two more important elements. Uh, music theory is kind of a smaller part. So this is really more of an isosceles triangle, you know, with two long sides and then that one short side in music theory. Um, I'll get into that more later on. Now this might go without saying, but aside from these three things, you also need to do a lot of listening, both actively and passively. You know, you need to look for jazz recordings that inspire you, something that's gonna, you know, make you want to really get into it and, and study. So if you haven't gotten to the point where you're listening to jazz on a daily basis, or you can't think of any recordings that you like, that's a good place to start, you know. Um, find things that inspire you and go from there, at least, you know, so you have some sort of direction to go in. And I will say that it wasn't until I started thinking as, um, of jazz as a language that I started to make progress. So I will be referring to this language, now, um, this language analogy throughout the video. So obviously, if you're gonna play jazz, you need to know jazz tunes. And uh, I don't think anyone would argue with that. Now, if we think back to that language analogy, think of tunes as topics. So in a conversation, you're usually on a particular topic, um, or sometimes a number of topics. And if you're familiar enough with them, you can contribute to the discussion and add your take. If not, it's usually pretty obvious 
You know, I think we've all been there either when, you know, it's we don't know what we're talking about or it's clear that somebody doesn't know what they're talking about and there's not much you can do in that case except for maybe just listen. Um, well, the same thing applies to when you show up to play jazz. If you're familiar enough with a lot of tunes, you're going to be able to fit in and go with the flow. If not, it'll be pretty obvious and you're going to have a hard time. So of course we can't know every single tune, but sometimes we'll just have to wing it and in that case sometimes our knowledge of other tunes or our familiarity with, you know, enough with the style can help us pick up a new one on the spot. So what does it mean to learn a tune? Well, for me it means getting as much out of that tune as you possibly can and knowing it well enough that you can confidently play it in a musical setting. So how does that work? Well, for beginners, maybe you just want to start off by learning the melody, uh, learn the chords, and learn how to improvise over it. That's a, you know, that's a pretty solid way to cover a tune, and you can use things like backing tracks, loop pedals, or just play along the recordings. And I actually have a video uh, where I describe how I like to work on tunes with a loop pedal, so I'll link that so you can check it out later. Um, if you're a bit more advanced or you're an intermediate player, you might want to try things like walking bass lines, uh, voice leading chord changes, or even composing like a written solo or an etude to play over the head. Um, basically, you just want to use the tune as a template for whatever you want to work on. So like maybe even like odd meters, different, you know, playing the tune in different tempos or feels or styles reharmonizations, chord melodies, one of my favorite things, you know, etc. But the, my point is you can get a full day's work out of even just one tune if you really get inside it, you know, and just think creatively. You think, what can I do with this tune? Then the possibilities are really endless. So one other thing that a lot of people talk about is playing tunes in all 12 keys. And yes, this is a great thing to do. Transposing really helps solidify your understanding of harmonic progressions and it's great brain work. But I will say, beginners beware. This is very heavy work and if you don't feel like you can do it, then just concentrate on one key, you know, the written key and get really good at that and then you can move on to trying different keys later on. But, um, I mean, I saw people at Berkeley who, you know, weren't really jazz players and, you know, in their first week of college, they were assigned to, you know, play, you know, tunes in all 12 keys. And yeah, it's, you know, it's college, it's academic, you're expected to do things like that, but it's very easy to get burned out like that, especially if it's your first time doing it. Um, it's, a, it's a more advanced task that really pushes you. And if you choose to do it, I would recommend maybe trying like three or four keys at a time. Uh, playing all 12 keys all the time is quite the adventure and it can be quite time consuming. So you have to, you know, think about how much time you actually have to practice in a day because if you, if you try to play all 12 keys, depending on how sharp you are, you know, how quickly you can do it in, in, your, in your head, it might take you all day. So um, transposing is great, but you know, just take it slow. And then one more thing you might, you might want to consider is investing in a real book. So just, you know, the sixth edition, volume one, that'll be a great place to start. That'll keep you busy for a while. I actually have volumes one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, volumes one, two, and three are pretty good. They have a lot of great songs. Um, and they're pretty accurately written. Four and five, are, are not quite as accurate, but I still like to have the collection of songs in my hands. I know some people have like apps, you know, the Real Book app, it just gives you the chord changes and you can, I'm sure you could find plenty of music online, but um, I just like to have it readily available, you know, and I can mark it up if necessary. And um, that's just me. But Real Book Volume 1 is a great place to start. Now, is it absolutely necessary? No. There was a time before real books where all of these songs were learned by ear 
and passed on from musician to musician, you know, teaching one another. Or some kid would go to a jazz concert, you know, and try to absorb as much as he could and then go home and practice it, you know, and try to learn it that way. So it's certainly possible to get by without one. But in this day and age, you know, we have them, they're extremely convenient, and uh, I would recommend getting one. Transcribing is an incredibly useful practice for any style of music, but it is absolutely essential for studying jazz. Going back to that language analogy, I like to think of transcribing as the learning of vocabulary and how to formulate meaningful phrases. So in this case, we're learning musical vocabulary and figuring out how to apply it to the tunes we play. And uh, this vocabulary is, and these phrases um, are really longer musical selections, like a full chorus of a solo or multiple choruses, you know, not just picking out licks here and there. Um, we need to see how it all connects and flows, just like when we speak a language, we need to know how natural dialogue is supposed to sound. You know, we can't just learn a bunch of random words and throw them together or just try to use it, you know, individually. It's not going to sound like we know a language. Well, jazz is the same thing. You need to, you know, you need to hear the whole thing, you know, hear the whole conversation. So how do you transcribe? Well, first find a solo that you like and really begin to familiarize yourself with it. Uh, if you don't have any in mind, then maybe ask some of your teachers or your friends who are into jazz what they might recommend. Now use your discretion because you don't want to do anything that's too crazy. So if it sounds incredibly difficult, then you know maybe you know find something that's a little bit uh, simpler for your first time. So listen to it carefully a handful of times, and when you feel you're, that you're ready, uh, go ahead and grab your instrument and try to start figuring it out. This part takes a lot of trial and error, but the repetition is part of the growth. And after you figure out enough, you know, and you're able to play a little bit of it, I would highly recommend writing it down. Even if you're not confident in your abilities to notate, um, the first few times might be a little bit rough, but the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. Also, writing these melodic phrases and rhythms and, and motives and seeing it all written out really helps helps uh, it solidify the feeling in your hands and in your mind, especially with rhythms. Uh, if you're at all, you know, shaky on your, on your rhythmic, you know, abilities, when you start transcribing and you start, you know, understand and seeing these rhythms and like writing them and seeing them over and over again, it's, it's going to be, uh, you're going to see a lot of growth there. If you really don't feel that you can write it down, then just try to play as much as you can by ear. It's okay. This is actually a good practice because it exercises your uh, musical memory. Um, I still believe writing it down is the best way to go, but uh, every now and then I'll actually do a solo for memory. You know, because uh, I've had teachers who you know highly recommended that as well, and um, I've I've had assignments where the point was to memorize it and not write it down. So it's a great practice and I'd say uh, in my personal transcribing uh, practices I'd, I'd do about 90% writing writing down and uh, maybe about 10% are ones that I just try to memorize. Um, after you complete the you know the whole solo the next part is just practicing it. Play it with a recording as best you can, or with a metronome or a backing track. You know, try playing it on the guitar in different positions, or even in different keys. Really try to get the solo down as best you can. And most importantly, try to get the feel of the solo. So um, that's one big thing about transcribing, is really try to mimic the person that you're hearing. And uh, it's, not just, it's not enough just to play the notes. You really gotta try to get that feel down. And after you've learned it through and through, you may want to experiment a bit by
tweaking some parts that you like, maybe your favorite parts, you know, you might want to tweak them a little bit and, and try to make something that sounds more unique, like yourself. Now you're not, you know, don't tweak the solo and, and you know, don't tweak the whole solo and play it that way, but kind of just, you know, take some excerpts and, um, you know, make the licks your own. This is a great thing, you know, to do instead of just copying a solo. You know, you want to eventually get to the point where you can have that solo as an influence while you're creating your own sound. So if this whole process seems way too over your head, which I get from students sometimes, then that's okay. Um, what I recommend to start off is just jamming with a solo. You know, you don't have to figure out the whole thing. Just put the solo on and try to jam along. Try to pick out a few licks here and there and get your ears used to working like that. One I recommend, the first solo I usually recommend for anybody to start transcribing is So What by Miles Davis. And uh, if they don't want to transcribe it, then I say, well, you know what, just throw on the recording, try to match some tones. You know, try to find your bearings. I'll even, you know, tell them it's D minor pentatonic. You know, and then for one section it goes up to a half step to E flat minor. But, you know, just try to get your bearings, try to, you know, find out a few things he's playing, maybe try to figure out a lick or, lick or two here and there. And those small steps um, can help lead to, you know, more advanced transcribing or the real thing. Um, one related practice would be to simply just take a tune and compose your own licks, compose your own solo, completely from scratch. So, you know, completely your own thing. This is great because it's a very organic practice and you're not gonna sound like anybody else. This is gonna be uniquely you. Um, I will say if you don't do any transcribing at all and you only do this, uh, your sound may not jive with the rest of the crowd. So they may like that, they may not like that. So it's a bit of a risk, you know. I still think it's good to, you know, ultimately I believe the ideal method is a combination of transcribing and composing your own lines. That way you're familiar enough with the style, you know, how it's supposed to sound, but you can also put your own spin on it. Um, just for the sake of this video and people who are just getting into jazz or looking for you know, a good approach to take, I recommend starting off with just transcribing and that will keep you busy for a while. Now every great improviser has put in this type of work. No one just decides that they want to play jazz and then just start blowing outstanding solos. It doesn't work that way. That would be like saying I want to speak a language and then just speaking it fluently without ever practicing it, it just doesn't work. You know, we know how that, you know, we know the hard work that needs to go into that Well, jazz is the same exact way. And it wasn't until I started looking at jazz uh, like a learning a language uh, that I really started making progress. Music theory. This is the smallest part of my jazz approach, the smallest part of the triangle. And you may be wondering why. You know, is that right? Uh, jazz is a pretty complex style of music. There's a lot of chords, you know, seventh chords, tensions, and beyond. Um, we got modes, scales, melodic minor, all kind of crazy stuff, you know. Isn't it useful to know all that and work on it? Well, yes, indeed it is and you will learn it. But I strongly believe that learning those tunes and building your vocabulary through transcribing are far, far more important practices when learning jazz. The thing is, you will learn plenty of music theory just by working on tunes and transcribing. When you work on tunes, if you do what I said in the earlier part of this video, if you take my, you know, approach, you're going to be using scales, you're going to be using chords and various voicings, you'll be learning progressions, learning what scales work where, you know, where, the, where notes sound good, where they don't sound good, and what doesn't work. Especially if you have a variety of tunes, you know, not just the same 
you know, diatonic progressions over and over again, or like one, six, two, five. Um, if you throw in some variety, maybe like throw in some Monk, you know, Wayne Shorter, Bill Evans, like John Coltrane, you know, when you study and are able to understand composers like that, you're gonna learn a whole century's worth of jazz music theory. So you'll be in good shape. As far as transcribing goes, you can see what scales and devices a particular soloist is using, you know, in a particular song. So you actually work through the changes and you take your time to see chord tones and identify harmonies and all that good stuff. You know, for example, like I before I started playing jazz and before I really started, you know, building my vocabulary, I knew a melodic minor scale. I knew how to play it. But I didn't sound like I knew it until I started transcribing and hearing how my fi favorite players, you know, used it. Um, hearing how this music theory is applied and learning it in action is a more valuable method than just reading it out of a book or playing, you know, scales up and down or exercises like that. So with that said, of course it's still good to practice your scales and your arpeggios and your chords and etc. Especially if it's a weak point for you. You know, say you need to work on your drop two voicings. Well, yeah, take a take a you know half hour, 45 minutes or whatever, and and work on your voicings and you know get that uh, you know build them up. But for as much music theory practice that you do, I would double the amount of learning tunes and transcribing. That's just what I recommend. Um, my point is that music theory can be very helpful, but to play jazz, it shouldn't be your main focus. And I think that's one mistake that a lot of people make. So yeah, I began this approach my sophomore year at Berkeley. Um, it took me about a year to get on the right track, but I've been adhering to it ever since. And uh, this jazz triangle, you know, and the reason I think of it as a triangle, and actually, you know, the actual shape itself, is uh, that when I was trying to decide, like, what I wanted to work on back then, I would just ask myself, you know, is this part of the triangle? It was an easy way for me to uh, visualize and keep myself pointed in the right direction. Um, if not, then I knew I had to concentrate on something else, at least for my jazz studies. Of course, I play a variety of music, different styles, you may as well. Um, but for that period of time that we're looking at jazz, uh, that we dedicate to studying jazz, I think the triangle is very helpful. If it works for you, great. Um, if not, no big deal. You know, you don't have to force yourself to you know, think like me. Uh, this just helps me focus. You know, it helps me uh, know what I need to work on. And uh, I, while I, I think there are three elements to it, I've actually had teachers who, some of them are very well known, but these, some of these teachers said, all you ever gotta do is work on tunes. Just work on tunes, you'll be fine. Don't transcribe, don't study music theory. All you need is tunes. And I can see, I can see how that's possible. You know, um, it's certainly, as I've already said in the video, you, know, you get a lot out of working on tunes. But um, you know, that's just one point of view. I've also had teachers who said, all you ever need to do is transcribe. And I can also see how that works, as I've pointed out in the transcription part of this video. It's extremely useful. You're gonna, you're gonna gain a lot just from transcribing. You'll, you'll, you'll really, it's possible to, to learn everything you need to know. If I had to pick one of those two, I'd actually go with transcribing. There's nothing wrong with learning tunes, but personally, my major weakness was my vocabulary, or lack thereof. And transcribing really fixed that. So that's where kind of, that's where my allegiance lies. You know, when I got to Berkeley and started playing jazz seriously, I, I knew a lot of tunes, or you know, at least enough to, uh, to hang out with people. But um, everybody else had a far better vocabulary than me. They've been transcribing, you know, since they were 
because they first started playing and I was very far behind. But uh, again, I, I knew a lot of tunes and, you know, because of that I was, uh, you know, could just kind of fit in wherever I, wherever I uh, decided to go. So one thing you may notice that's uh, missing from this regimen is technique. And you're th probably thinking, isn't that important too? Well, of course it is. But specifically relating to jazz, I don't consider it essential. One thing I'll point out is that when you're learning your vocabulary, you do build a lot of technique. And it's good because it's specific technique, you know, tailored to execute the particular phrases you like. You know, you just play the, the licks and, you know, your, your lines over and over again. You're going to build technique that way. Of course you are. But it's the finger patterns and the, the, the physical exercises that I don't really make time for. Of course, they're great if you have extra time and you need a little bit of a workout. Uh, I have another video where I discuss this in greater detail and I'm, you know, where I say that it's possible to focus too much on technique and not enough on musicality. And um, my point in that video is that I think a lot of people, and I used to be one of them, but I, I think there's a belief that your fingers can get to a point where they're totally independent and you've reached the highest level of technical proficiency and you can just play anything you want. And as I've stated in this video, that's just not the case. You know, no matter how fast your fingers can move, you still need to learn vocabulary and tunes to ex execute this vocabulary. You need to learn that language. You need to learn the topics, be familiar with it. Otherwise, you're gonna be out, you're gonna have a hard time. So that's just my, you know, two cents on technique. You can check out my other video if you want. And that's gonna wrap up this video. Uh, so thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and uh, hit that subscribe button. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. You know, do you agree with this approach? Do you study jazz? How so? What are your approaches? And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. So everybody take care and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.